All right, let's get straight into it. We're focusing today on a critical issue in trauma care, the trauma lethal triad, that's coagulopathy, acidosis, and hypothermia. It's this uh, vicious cycle that spirals fast. And if we don't break it early, the outcomes, well, they're often devastatingly poor. Our goal here is really direct. Mm -hmm. What are the most actionable things providers can do, like right now, to stop this cycle? We need specifics. Exactly. Time is absolutely everything in these cases. For anyone managing severe trauma, that window for intervention is incredibly tight. Okay, first up, hypothermia. It often seems like the first domino to fall, and it just wrecks the body's ability to clot, doesn't it? Right. So what are the absolute must-do steps right away to prevent heat loss or treat it aggressively? You're right. It's a huge amplifier for bleeding. We have to remember that clotting enzymes, they're incredibly sensitive to temperature. Even a small drop, just a few degrees below 37 Celsius, it severely impacts platelet function and uh, the whole clotting cascade. Okay, so it's not just about comfort. It's core physiology. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Intervention needs to be active and hit multiple points. First, active external warming. That means things like forced air warming systems, heating blankets, warming pads, applied right to the torso, the core, and limbs. And what about the fluids we're pouring in? A shock patient needs volume, massive volume sometimes, but cold fluids? They can kill too, right? Critically important point. Every single thing going into the patient must be warmed. You cannot give a cold fluid load. So warmed 5e fluids, warmed blood products, even warmed medications if possible. If you're using a rapid infuser, you have to make sure that warmer is working and working well. Ah. And this extends to the environment itself. Keep the trauma bay warm, keep the operating room warm, high ambient temperature. So we're actively driving that temperature up, mm -hmm. not just passively waiting. What about simple things like exposure during the assessment or transport? Yeah, the simple stuff matters hugely. Minimize how long the patient is uncovered, period. During your secondary survey, sure, you need to look, but cover everything else up immediately. Use those insulating blankets. Protect against heat loss from convection, from radiation. Every bit of speed and vigilance here buys you critical time for the other parts of the triad. Okay, so hypothermia slows clotting, and it also seems to feed right into the next problem acidosis. Acidosis tells us tissues aren't getting enough oxygen, right? They're switching to anaerobic metabolism. When we're resuscitating, pushing fluids, how do we make sure we're helping perfusion without causing, you know, another metabolic mess? That's a key challenge. The acidosis comes from, well, two places mainly. The tissue ischemia itself producing lactic acid and Potentially from our resuscitation efforts, if we're not careful, we've learned this the hard way over the years. Fluid choice is really, really important here. Yeah. We need to be using balanced crystalloids. Balanced crystalloids, like lactated ringers. Plasmolite. Exactly, like <laughs> lactated ringers or plasmolite. We have to avoid large volumes of normal saline. Why is that? Normal saline used to be the go-to. Because of the chloride load, it's very high in normal saline, and that pushes the patient towards a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. So you're basically adding an acid burden from the fluid on top of the lactic acid burden from the shock itself. Ah, uh, okay. So it makes the existing acidosis worse. Precisely. And that acidosis, it weakens heart muscle contraction. It further messes up the clotting cascade that's already struggling. We need fluids that support physiology, not ones that disrupt the pH balance even more. Makes total sense. Don't add fuel to the fire. Mm. Since acidosis reflects poor perfusion, how do we monitor if our fluids and blood are actually working down at the tissue level? The best immediate marker we have is lactate. We track lactate levels. They really show us tissue hypoperfusion and the severity of the metabolic acidosis. Dual check. Yes, you need serial lactate measurements. If those levels aren't coming down, it's a signal. It tells you the underlying oxygen debt isn't being resolved. But of course, the fundamental fix for acidosis and trauma is stopping the cause of the shock. That means controlling the bleeding fast. Direct pressure, tourniquets, hemostatic agents, getting to the operating room for surgical control. And alongside that, Optimizing oxygen delivery is critical. Maintain that airway, use ventilation if needed, correct hypoxia quickly. That's how you stabilize the metabolic side. All right, we've talked temperature, we've talked metabolism. Now, coagulopathy, this often feels like a result of both dilution from fluids and just, well, using up all the clotting factors from bleeding away. Yeah. The approach here seems to have changed dramatically. What's the modern standard for giving blood products? You're right, the thinking has shifted. We now treat coagulopathy as an immediate systemic problem in major trauma, not something that just happens later. It all falls under the umbrella of damage control resuscitation or DCR. And a core part of that is a balanced transfusion strategy right from the get-go. Balanced transfusion. You mean the specific ratios. Exactly. 
The standard now for a massive transfusion protocol is the 1.1.1 ratio. That's one unit of packed red blood cells to one unit of fresh frozen plasma to one unit of platelets. Okay. The idea is to replace what's being lost in roughly the same proportions as whole blood. So you're not just giving oxygen carriers, you're giving the plasma factors and the platelets needed to actually form a clot. So getting plasma and platelets in early is vital recognizing that just diluting with crystalloids or red cells alone can be harmful. What about medications? Where does something like tranexamic acid fit in? Ah, uh, tranexamic acid or TXA. It's an antifibrinolytic. Its job is basically to stop the clot from breaking down once it's formed. And the evidence here is quite strong. TXA needs to be given early to trauma patients if you suspect significant bleeding. How early is early? Ideally, within the first three hours of injury, the data shows that's where the maximum benefit is in terms of reducing mortality from hemorrhage and cutting down transfusion needs. Giving TXA promptly is uh, really a non-negotiable part of managing coagulopathy now. Okay. And for monitoring all this, standard labs like PT, PTT, often take too long to come back in these fast-moving situations. How do the newer point-of-care tests help guide things in real time? That's a great point. Those traditional labs are often way behind the curve. Point-of-care testing is essential. We use things like rotational thrombolistometry rotum or standard thrombolistography TEG. These tests give you a functional picture of the entire clotting process, how quickly it starts, how strong the clot gets, whether it's breaking down too fast. And you get this information in minutes right at the bedside. So it's much more dynamic. Much more. For instance, if your TEG or ROTEM shows poor clot strength, that points towards a fibrinogen problem. So you can specifically target that. Give fibrinogen concentrate or cryoprecipitate right then, rather than just guessing or waiting for lab results or just pushing more plasma hoping it helps. It allows for a much more targeted, efficient resuscitation. So we've broken down the individual parts. Mm. Hypothermia, acidosis, coagulopathy. But in reality, you're dealing with all three at once, aren't you? They feed off each other. How do we pull these separate strategies together into a single practical approach when that severely injured patient arrives? That's where the concept of damage control resuscitation really comes into play. DCR is the framework. It acknowledges that in that initial chaotic phase, you're not aiming for perfect anatomical repair. You're aiming for physiological stabilization first. Keep the patient alive long enough to get to definitive care. Okay, so DCR is the overarching strategy. What are its main pillars? You can think of it as having three key pillars, really. First, aggressive early hemorrhage control, stop the bleeding. Second, balanced transfusion, that 1.1.1 ratio we talked about started early. No. And third, permissive hypotension. Right, permissive hypotension. That one always generates discussion. How do you balance keeping the pressure low enough to maybe help control bleeding, but high enough to perfuse the brain and other vital organs? It's definitely a balancing act and it's dynamic. Permissive hypertension usually means targeting a systolic pressure somewhere in the range of, say, 80 to 90 millimeters of mercury, or a mean arterial pressure that's high enough for cerebral perfusion, but low enough that you're not blasting off newly formed clots or driving up pressure in injured vessels. It's most relevant before you achieve definitive surgical control of the bleeding. Got it. So it's a temporary bridge. Exactly. And making all three parts of DCR happen together seamlessly requires intense teamwork, emergency department, surgery, anesthesia, critical care, the blood bank. Everyone needs to be on the same page, using the same protocols, ready to act instantly. And it really boils down to speed, doesn't it? Recognizing the risk early. Absolutely. Identifying the patient who's at risk for the lethal triad or already heading into it, that's the key. You have to trigger that DCR protocol, get the 1.1.1 1. 1. 1 blood products moving, start the active warming, give the TXA before the patient is profoundly hypothermic, acidotic, and coagulopathic, waiting until all those numbers are terrible. So the core message seems crystal clear. Breaking the lethal triad isn't about tackling one thing then the next. It requires hitting all three, temperature, metabolism, coagulation, simultaneously and aggressively. That's exactly right. Treating one in isolation just doesn't work. They're too interconnected. And maybe the final thought for listeners is about their own systems. How quickly can your unit, your hospital, actually execute all these steps together? Can you shave minutes off the time between that patient hitting the door and getting that first unit of 1.1.1 transfusion, maybe guided by a rapid tag or rotem? Because that speed, that system efficiency, that's ultimately what saves lives in these incredibly challenging cases.